the original Xbox One. Launched in 2013 as the successor to the Xbox 360, the Xbox One was a bit of a curious system. It was conceived as a true all-in-one box, during a period when traditional TV was more popular and motion controls were in vogue. To that end, it came with a Kinect sensor, broadcast TV integration, and an imposing $500 US dollar price tag. Unfortunately, it was cut back relative to its nearest competition, the PlayStation 4. Microsoft fundamentally made a bet on memory technology that wouldn't pan out. Predicting that DDR3 plus a sizable chunk of on-die ES RAM was the way to go, leaving the Xbox One with a lower bandwidth memory system than the GDDR5 equipped PS4, substantially less GPU compute performance, the same RAM capacity, and a similar overall bill of materials cost. Plus, the console design itself wasn't especially attractive. The Xbox One was massive, with a generic VCR-like design and a sizable power brick. The upshot of these concessions was a whisper-quiet console, but the machine could be difficult to find room for in a home entertainment system. Now, in time, Microsoft would correct these mistakes. Nine months after launch, the tech behemoth would release an Xbox One without a Kinect sensor that matched the PS4 on price dropping the machine's signature but scarcely used peripheral. And in 2016 and 2017, Microsoft released two successor consoles, the Xbox One S and One X, that brought performance improvements, new features, and much slimmer designs with integrated power supplies. And it's the Xbox One S that was a little bit curious here. While broadly similar to the original unit, the One S did boast a clock increase in the GPU, taking the GCN-based Radeon design from 853 MHz to 914 MHz, a 7.1% increase in frequency and GPU compute. The bandwidth-rich ES RAM increased in performance correspondingly, moving up to 219 GB per second in bi-directional transfer speed. Plus, the new console came with a bevy of new display features. Owing to its support for the HDMI 2.0 output standard, the performance increases here weren't massive, but they did give the performance-starved console a bit more overhead to deal with demanding games. This new system replaced the original Xbox One for the purposes of Digital Foundry's cross-platform analyses, and hasn't been revisited in depth since. So we thought we'd take a look at some of the most demanding cross-generation software to see how this original unit fares with modern titles. The Xbox One we've tested is an original 2013 console that was purchased shortly after launch and has been used continuously since, a nearly nine-year-old machine that really should be showing its age. This is the weakest officially supported hardware that can run the likes of Cyberpunk 2077, Battlefield 2042, and Elden Ring, blockbuster titles that can have performance problems on even the fastest of the current gen consoles. We've captured seven recent games to see exactly how this flawed, weak console can hold up against some of the most ambitious cross-gen titles. These are games that increasingly seem to be targeting far superior current-gen hardware. So how do they hold up on this largely forgotten, underpowered last-gen machine? Let's find out. First up is Cyberpunk 2077, a very challenging title. Despite recent patches that purport to improve frame rates, performance is absolutely miserable here. The game runs in the low to mid 20s much of the time. Really, anytime you aren't staring at a wall, the game struggles to crack 25 FPS. Basic traversal, whether walking or driving, is very often around 20 FPS, with massive jitter, horrible input latency, and stuttering animation. Things break down even further in combat. Here, frame rates can dip as low as the mid-teens at worst, even in these early game combat encounters. When input response is at its most crucial, Cyberpunk simply cannot hold a remotely acceptable level of performance. To add insult to injury here, Cyberpunk often subjects the player to extended stutters on Xbox One. Just stepping in the elevator provokes a two and a half second freeze, and walking around the game world regularly induces similar pauses. Now there are some other visual issues as well. Streaming problems are common, with textures and objects that can take seconds to load in. Plus, the resolution hues quite close to 720p for the most part, with a blurry and imprecise resolve that is often dominated by very low quality screen space effects. But the frame rate problems are the primary concern here, as the game is borderline unplayable. The low power Jaguar cores and ancient hard drive simply cannot deliver a tolerable rendition of Night City, which is just too dense with detail and simulation. Let's move on to another tough one, Call of Duty Vanguard. 
This World War II based Call of Duty title is a technical showpiece on current generation hardware with great materials work and beautiful lighting. So how does it work on Xbox One? Visually it holds up quite well, with graphics that are broadly comparable to the game on the more powerful recent consoles. There are some nips and tucks in the resolution which seems to max out around 900p with frequent dips below. There's a bit of a disservice to the high quality of the underlying artwork, but the game still looks quite good. Performance is a different story. The target here is 60 FPS, but in most sequences, 40 to 55 FPS is the typical run of play. Long stretches of combat play out in this region, with plenty of jitter and the occasional frame time spike. The tearing in the top portion of the screen helps to increase moment to moment fluidity, a technique also employed in Cyberpunk, as well as many other titles. But the game still feels very unstable. To be fair, some smaller indoor sequences do manage to stick to 60 FPS for extended periods sweeping through this house, for instance. But as soon as we enter the enemy dense foyer, we're back to the 40s and 50s, with some lengthy stutters to punctuate the combat as well. And Vanguard's first person cinematics, which push high quality screen space shadows, higher detail models, and cleaner shadow maps, drag performance down further. Here, the game is typically between 30 and 40 FPS. They do run poorly, but this is easier to excuse than the slowdown during gameplay sequences. In line with other recent Battlefield titles, Battlefield 2042 is a console pushing showcase. Visual fidelity didn't take too much of a step here from Battlefield 5, but map size and player count both saw big increases on current gen consoles and PC. However, the Xbox One version is limited to 64 players on smaller maps. So is this enough to keep performance in check? Unfortunately not. Battlefield 2042 operates with an unlocked frame rate here and essentially never hits 60 FPS in its primary gameplay modes. 40 to 50 FPS is the typical result, with plenty of jitter and inconsistency, mitigated slightly by the same top screen tearing we saw in prior titles. To make matters worse, frame time spikes make a return here on occasion, in addition to very frequent rubber banding, which is a networking issue that momentarily pauses player movement without technically affecting the frame rate. This is a problem on current gen machines as well, but feels more common here, even when playing the game on a wired connection. Image quality isn't great either, with an alias looking presentation at a resolution that's usually hovering around 900p. It's possible that a more aggressive dynamic res would help, but I suspect we're mostly CPU constrained. Battlefield games typically don't flatter older hardware, but I can't say the game feels particularly good to play and other recent Battlefield titles, while demanding, managed to deliver much stronger showings on this class of hardware. But more on this later. From Software's Elden Ring isn't exactly a technical showpiece, but it is still one of the most demanding games around on any console system. There are a variety of issues here on the Xbox One. Firstly, the dreaded FromSoft 30fps cap is back. Elden Ring technically targets 30 FPS on Xbox One, but this 30 FPS cap is punctuated by frequent frame rate fluctuations that ruin any sense of fluidity, even when the game should be hitting a solid 30 FPS. Unlike other last gen Souls games, however, Elden Ring almost always falls short of this target anyways. Elden Ring mostly hovers in the mid to high 20s during traversal, in the early sections of the game at least, with some areas proving more troublesome than others. There's a constant feeling of stutter here, as the game oscillates between 33, 50, and 16 millisecond gaps between frames. Engaging with a group of enemies tends to pull frame rates down further, as low as the high teens in my testing, though often around 25 FPS. Larger stutters also occur with some frequency. In a game as challenging as Elden Ring, these performance issues aren't just annoying. They make an already difficult game much harder. The visuals on Xbox One are rather unimpressive as well, with low quality shadows, plenty of pop-in, and a 900p resolution. Elden Ring demands much more powerful hardware for stable performance, despite not pushing visual or technical boundaries on any class of machine. Tales of Arise is another Japanese RPG, though certainly a more technically accomplished one. This Unreal Engine 4 based title impresses for a cross-gen game, with beautifully stylized artwork, great animations, and stunning cinematic sequences. So how does it fare on the original Xbox One? Unfortunately, Bandai Namco has elected to leave the framerate uncapped, with quite variable results. 
at its best, you can indeed reach some quite high frame rates in excess of 50 FPS and sometimes even reaching 60 FPS briefly, but only in quite small indoor areas. In outdoor areas though, 30 to 45 FPS is much more typical. On paper, these aren't horrible frame rates, but again, the inconsistency is quite grating. Why not just cap the frame rate and aim for a stable 30 FPS here? But the Xbox One does manage to hold above 30 FPS for the most part, with relatively infrequent dips below, at least when you're walking around the world and watching cutscenes. Combat, as you might expect, is the exception. Early game encounters perform mostly okay, but later in the game, with a larger party, performance is much more deeply compromised. In this encounter about six hours into the game, we're already in the low to mid 20s for decent portions of this fight, even though we only have half of our party members at this point in the game. Unfortunately, the Xbox One and Xbox Series versions of the game are separate applications, so I can't transfer my in-game saves here. But based on my experiences in that version, I suspect performance with a full six member party in later content should prove even more trying on Microsoft's last gen machine. Image quality can be a bit shimmery at times as well, and the game seems to run at a locked resolution around 972p. I suspect a lower resolution target paired with a 30 FPS cap could have resolved most of the issues here, but it just feels like the Xbox One version wasn't given the attention that it deserved. We'll close out with a pair of racing games that are a bit of a change of pace from what we've seen thus far. First up is Grid Legends, an attractive, albeit thoroughly cross-gen, track-based racer. Good news first. This is the first game that we've discussed that manages to hit a solid frame rate most of the time. 30 FPS is the target here, and typical gameplay sails by at a consistent and smooth feeling 30 FPS. Regardless of weather conditions or the number of vehicles on track, Grid Legends is almost always at 30 FPS on base Xbox One during gameplay, with just a few exceptions. Firstly, the flashback feature that allows you to rewind the game state a limited number of times per race to correct mistakes does tend to drop some frames. Depending on the section of track and the density of cars, 25 to 30 FPS is the typical readout during these sequences. Gameplay isn't seriously affected here, but the drops are fairly noticeable. There are some dips in general gameplay as well, although these are usually pretty limited. Typically these amount to just a few dropped frames before clearing up pretty quickly. Perhaps the game just needs a moment or two for the DRS system to adjust to an increase in load. It's not a big deal at all really, and I suspect most players won't even notice. On occasion you can provoke a much larger frame rate drop however, though only in somewhat contrived circumstances. For instance, in this race on the brand's hatch circuit, I set myself to start at the back of the grid, increased all the weather effects, and tried to tailgate the other vehicles. On the second turn, with heavy alpha effects and over a dozen cars on screen, I managed to get Grid Legends to buckle pretty hard, reaching a low of 20 FPS on the Xbox One. This is atypical, but it is possible to generate scenarios in gameplay that can really push the aging hardware. It is worth noting, however, the rest of the race did proceed at locked 30 FPS, outside of a couple clutches of dropped frames. So gameplay is generally fine. Replays, however, are another story. The combination of deeper camera angles that capture more of the action and some settings increases, most notably smoother real-time cube maps on the cars, leads to poor performance here. These spend long periods in the low to mid 20s in more demanding conditions, and at worst, can dip into the mid teens. The results here are generally quite good, but there is a bit of a feeling, as with Tales of Arise, that the Xbox One has been overlooked somewhat. The resolution, which typically hovers around 900p with DRS enabled, and visual settings are generally appropriate here for gameplay sequences. But replays perform quite poorly and should probably run at a reduced settings quality relative to where they are now. Visual boosts for replays are usually appreciated, of course, but they shouldn't lead to show-stopping framerate issues. Lastly, finally, Forza Horizon 5, an absolutely stunning and remarkably scalable game that delivers great results on all console platforms, and the Xbox One is no exception here. Forza Horizon 5 pushes a very solid 30 FPS, with a dynamic 1080p resolution backed up by 4 times MSAA. Performance is very consistent. The game is basically locked at 30 FPS during both gameplay and replay sequences, with one major exception. I encountered some occasional hitches during my time playing Forza Horizon 5 on this older machine. These typically last for a half second or less 
and occur when driving at speed through the open world, and seem related to streaming. Forza Horizon 5 is an asset-rich game even stripped of the high-detail LODs, but are used in the more powerful consoles, so a periodic issue here isn't a surprise. But I did encounter one other rather odd issue when testing Forza Horizon 5 on Xbox One, and that brings us to some platform comparisons. Loading times in Forza Horizon 5 seemed a bit slow on the Xbox One, so I thought I'd take a look at loading times and compare them across the Xbox One and the One S. Forza Horizon 5 loads a whopping 35% faster on the One S, while other titles improve by less impressive, though still in some cases quite significant, margins. The numbers here are an average of three tests, to ensure consistent results. Far Cry 6 and Forza Horizon 5 show fairly large improvements here, while the other titles are only slightly faster on the more recent hardware. Now it's possible that the hard drive in the Xbox One has degraded somewhat in performance over time, or that the hard drive in the One S is simply capable of somewhat quicker speeds. Still, the loading time swings from title to title confuse quite a bit here. Let's move on to frame rate comparisons. Here, we know that the GPU clock has been increased by 7.1% on the Xbox One S, which should produce a palpable, though not huge, performance gap across a range of titles between these two machines. Tales of Arise is a good test case game here, as it meets three important criteria for evaluating the hardware differences. It seems to be typically GPU limited in most scenes. It has an unlocked frame rate to easily observe performance fluctuations, and it appears to use a static resolution so the rendering workload should be identical across the machines in matching footage. The clock increase translates to a roughly 2 to 4 FPS higher frame rate in matching footage here, which is roughly in line with the clock speed increase. As we swap through these scenes, notice how the teal line is consistently above the green line. There's a linear and predictable performance boost. This is the sort of small difference you'd expect to see in general, this clock bump is perhaps a small factor in this title, with rendering performance between the two machines being quite similar overall. In other titles, the results are understandably less consistent. Cyberpunk 2077, for example, runs substantially better on the One S in scenes that seem to be more GPU limited, like in this first person cutscene where the One S outperforms its older sibling by 3 FPS or so. In some cases, this can even mean achieving the elusive 30 FPS target frame rate, a big improvement. But when we start the car here, performance on both consoles levels out. The heavy streaming demands of this gameplay really stress out the CPU and leave the two machines on essentially even footing over the course of the drive. Elden Ring is much the same and doesn't seem to show meaningful performance differences when navigating the open world. If a game is CPU limited, or if the dynamic resolution system effectively balances load, frame rates should be similar between the two machines. But there are workloads where the Xbox One falls noticeably behind its replacement. But let's focus back on performance on Xbox One. Broadly speaking, there are three kinds of games here. Firstly, there are some titles that are shipping at an inexplicably low performance level on the old machines. Tales of Arise and Elden Ring fall into this category. These are games that aren't necessarily pushing anything too technically impressive, but still run rather poorly on the Xbox One, whether that comes down to an improper configuration or deeper technical issues. Secondly, there's the occasional game that performs well across all platforms, including the Xbox One. Forza Horizon 5 manages to turn in a very consistent 30 FPS here while keeping up a high level of visual fidelity, and as a bonus, scales beautifully to higher end platforms as well. It doesn't run perfectly on the Xbox One, but it's still a solid version that is worth recommending. Lastly, there are some titles that do seem to justify their poor performance a little bit more. Cyberpunk 2077 and Call of Duty Vanguard are boundary-pushing cross-generation games that are pushing graphical and simulation complexity. During a cross-generation period, you'd expect games like these to have trouble maintaining decent frame rates on the ancient hardware, and you'd probably hope that similarly ambitious titles would just drop support for the older machines altogether. And that's important, because there is some solid evidence that as we move through the cross-gen period, owners of last-gen consoles are increasingly getting a degraded experience, particularly in these more ambitious games. Call of Duty Vanguard performs significantly worse than Call of Duty Modern Warfare, for instance, 
Though Modern Warfare isn't a perfect 60 FPS by any means, it does hold 60 FPS more often and doesn't tend to drop as hard under load. A similar margin shows up in the comparison between Battlefield 2042 and Battlefield 5. Despite pushing the same large-scale 64-player gameplay, Battlefield 5 operates at a much higher performance level and actually manages to run at 60 FPS or very close to it most of the time. Both of these comparisons pit the most recently released last-gen exclusive version against their more recent cross-gen releases, and in both cases performance has taken a dive. You get the sense that these titles would have held more stable frame rates on this hardware if they had been released a couple of years ago, when developers would have been treating the Xbox One hardware as more of a first-class target instead of a secondary concern. And that's a bit of a problem, because many upcoming titles are slated to release on this hardware, and we're bound to see more unsatisfactory Xbox One releases soon. As we approach the end of the cross-gen era, some titles are dropping planned support for last-gen machines, but many big-ticket games are likely to really struggle here. So in conclusion, how does the original Xbox One hold up in 2022? Not very well, though it does vary on a game-by-game -game basis. Anyone still regularly using a base Xbox One would be well advised to move to a current generation system. While the Xbox One is still capable of running most new releases, the experience leaves a lot to be desired. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and press the bell for YouTube notifications. To view a high quality version of this video, check out the Patreon at digitalfoundry.net, and to get in touch, just use Twitter. That's all for me for now. Thanks for watching.